Excellent. All right. Thanks, Royd. Um, yes. Yeah, so, uh, so tonight, um, well, as you say, equal experts were uh, mostly do end-to-end -end software delivery, a lot of agile transformation work, uh, transformation through delivery, which is why this is going to be a presentation based on um, a, so an agile transformation that we I worked on about a year ago, uh, which was um, agile transformation. It's always uh, how to define the success of a, of a transformation. Um, ultimately, it was quite successful. We'll, I'll take you through the whole um, the story of how it happened, everything we tried on the way, and the revelation at the end of actually this is the, the key thing. And then looking back over lessons learned from other clients, you start to see these patterns emerging. Um, so, um, so yes, yeah, so I just want to, I'll, I'll take you through that. I'll crack on with it before I <laughs> give the whole presentation without showing a slide. So once upon a time, I'll tell you a story. This is the story of, um, of an agile transformation. Um, so we went, we were engaged by a client that uh, had, they were trying to build some, build some software, build a new product, new financial um, online payment product. Um, and they were having problems getting software out the door, meeting deadlines for delivery. Um, and they wanted to figure out how to go faster. Uh, and they thought that um, agile might be the way uh, to, to achieve that. So we had a look at what their environment was like. We got involved with the delivery teams. Uh, we actually put a couple of people in each of their teams to understand the pain that they were going through, as well as looking over sort of the entire processes. And as we got started, this is what we found. So fragmented teams. Um, the setup was they were delivering this product over five geographic locations, uh, two in the UK and three in different countries abroad. The teams were not only geographically fragmented, but they were also skill set fragmented. So you had C developers <coughs> in one team, you had Java developers in another team, and database engineers in another team. And then they were also responsible for different components, different parts of the system. Um, so then mashing it all together and trying to make it work was obviously quite a uh, complex, risky, time consuming process. They also had uh, a lot of dense requirements documentation. So they had, uh, they had solution architecture documentation. They had technical architecture <coughs> documentation, which was how the thing should actually run in production. They had their requirements documentation, all in use cases in Word documents flying around. Um, they had test specifications in Excel spreadsheets, et cetera, et cetera. So they then also had started on some put, introducing some improper engineering techniques. So they had they had some automated tests, but as you can see, they were quite flaky. They were end-to-end -end automated tests that you were never sure the environments were up and running properly, so the tests would fail. Um, the tests would fail for random reasons. You'd run it five times and it would pass, but then it would be failing again. So um, at this point. We've got our concerned face on. It's like there's, a, there's quite a few smells, quite a few issues here. Um, so then if you add to that, there's an unclear scope for any given release. Uh, and the release dates were um, a variable feast and infrequent releases to production. They had zero control over configuration, which is why the environments were going down, which is one of the reasons why all of their tests couldn't run in um, uh, in a reliable fashion. Um, siloed acceptance test team. So I didn't even show you the board that the separate acceptance test team had where they were running their own automated tests. Um, remote and inexperienced scrum masters. So they'd already cottoned onto the idea that they thought maybe Agile would help them go a bit faster. So from one of their suppliers, they brought in some scrum masters and they had remote scrum masters running some onshore teams. Um, no clear ownership of code. So for any one component, any tests that were failing, no one was clearly identified as uh, you're responsible for fixing this test and making sure it works, um, and failing manual deployments. Deployments. So now, a little bit more worried. We're beyond concerned. So this is a high-level overview of the process. <coughs> um, they were designing stuff up front, which is where the architecture, the solution architecture documentation came from. They were then building stuff and planning things out for a test phase and then deploying, et cetera. But in reality, as sort of bad as that looks, it ended up being like this. So the first one scheduled, first release scheduled looks all fine, great. But because of all the problems in the overrun and the build and the test, 
and the, you've got to start designing. The designers have run out of work to do, so they start designing the next thing, but everything else is slipping. So then you end up by the third or fourth release, you're designing stuff that's a year away from even starting implementation, never mind deployment. So now we're moving into, into horror, but actually I realized, sorry, more up to date should be this chappy. <laughs> um, so, so what would we do? So trying to fix the issues. Obviously, there's lots to go out there. There's lots to work on. So we looked at switching the test strategy. I'll talk more about that in a minute. We looked at introducing agile planning techniques and also changing um, the way they were doing their architecture and design to make that more collaborative. Because there was no way we're going to, as a big organization, we couldn't um, get rid of the architecture work. Like people had to do that. That was part of their process for getting things approved. So we sort of we thought we'll we'll attack it on these three angles um, and brought people in to work on on them, on all of those areas. So the new test strategy. So we addressing the flaky tests. So we stopped doing end to end automated testing, um, or not stopped it, but instead of that being the main way that we tested, we started introducing unit tests. Um, so and, and, and showing the developers how to do test run development and also creating um, component level tests so we could test the component in isolation from the flaky environments that we had um, and then also have some, some reliability uh, in, the, uh, in the test execution. So with the goal of getting rid of the red build monitors because obviously a, a build monitor that's red all the time you, you kind of you lose faith in and if it flickers and no one's made any changes you lose faith. Um, and we also tackled the siloed acceptance test team and we took members of those teams and pulled them into the, into the sprint teams, turning them more into sort of delivery teams as much as possible. Um, so we got a long way down that road. We, did, we managed to improve the test automation culture. So we had ownership for all the different parts. We can see that there's actually, it's, it's mostly green, which you want what you want. Things will still go red because they break, that's fine, but that's a real indicator that there's a problem now, so we can jump on that and we can fix it. Whereas before, no one would fix anything because it was always sporadically red. So agile planning, great. So we wanted to get rid of the big requirements documents. We wanted to change the unclear scope for any given release, and we wanted to get some clarity over what the release dates were going to be. So we started looking at what all the different techniques that we can do that. So again, this is a quite a big delivery. They weren't willing to slim everyone, um, all the teams down to make this simpler. So we started, we put up a, a, a big release board for the entire release, plan things out at the epic level so that all members from all the teams or representatives from all the teams could get round. You've got visibility of what the requirements are there. If it's not on that board, it's not in the release. You can then start planning out. These are actually, so these are teams, columns for teams, you can see there's quite a lot of teams. Um, line items for, um, no, sorry, that's wrong. Columns for dates. No, columns for teams, line items for dates. So these are sort of like um, sprints along here. So we're identifying that the work will go in these particular sprints. That gives us an idea to do some rough and ready planning that the teams are brought into. So then they can say, actually, yes, that's a date that's achievable. And it's visible. And if there's people thinking that there's something in there that's not achievable, they can call it out, but it's, but it's visible, it's not hidden away in a Gantt chart anymore. Um, so then on, uh, and then obviously scrum boards for each team, but the, the big thing was how do we make the program planning a bit more visible? Um, and then collaborative design. So we we're looking at solution architects that were designing in isolation, technical architects were then translating that into what it needed to actually, what the infrastructure needed to be based on the document rather than a conversation. And delivery teams were stuck in the middle going, we've got to build this and I'm going to, and then I build it and then, oh, it doesn't look anything like the technical architects were expecting, so it doesn't work when it's deployed. So um, we're then taking, taking the assets that they're producing, which are useful assets, so actually a a network architecture diagram is quite a useful thing because then delivery teams know, well, actually, there's now a box between this and, and we, we know that this line doesn't exist yet. This line, the firewalls aren't open. So how can we take those collaborative, collaborative design approaches, take solution architects, tech leads, and technical architects, get them in the same room and start visualizing this thing so they're all working together on the same assets. Um, and again, here's, a, here's where we actually said, well, we took that information, we started planning it out. So to get into this environment, we need to do these things, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
So that's, we had lots to go at. We were using all of these techniques, pulling tools out of the toolbox and saying, right, let's do that, let's give this a go, let's give this a go. Lots of activity, everyone getting really involved in it. Um, so the big question is though, did it work? Um, yeah, somewhat, somewhat. So we've got some people who are feeling a bit happier about it. This is the end of a retrospective for one of the teams, but it's pretty representative of what was going on. Um, some people are super happy just because they're seeing things happy, uh, happening. Um, most of the people are sort of, yeah, that's, it's, still, it's still a bit of a mess, to be honest. It's still quite painful. Um, so then what? So we've been banging on from day one um, about, actually, let's just, can we cut half the teams? Can we go smaller? Um, can we, uh, can we ti create time box releases? Um, and eventually, after all of this effort and all of these attempts at change and then still seeing that the dates are slipping, etc., <clears throat> we managed to convince the, uh, the senior stakeholders of the product to move to monthly releases. So the idea being, and this is what we're shooting for, well, I'm saying monthly releases, obviously some people in the room will release them daily or, or weekly, but we're going from a release every six to nine months um, infrequent to saying, right, no, let's squash all that down to every month. Um, so let's go, let's do our build and our test all at the same time. I haven't drawn it here, but actually here you can be doing the design for the next bit. So you're only a month ahead. It's not, not too bad, but those solution architects have got something to do. They can start paving the way. And then, you know, this should just then, we've got a smaller chunk of change. It should be a smaller deploy effort and um, part of the problem was calling, causing problems with our deployments was we had nine months worth of change to try and get into the, uh, into the production environment. So they went for that eventually. In reality, it ended up looking like this. So we were still, we were pulling the test team in, but they still weren't happy. They're still saying, no, we need to do our separate um, acceptance testing after that. Um, but we did hit for five months in a row, a release to production every month, which is something that they'd never seen before. Obviously the small, the, the amount of work that was going through was a lot smaller than they were expecting, but they managed to, they, you know, they got a lot of benefits out of this. They started being able to introduce the behaviors. They realized that actually they can now scale down the teams because they were getting more work through than they were previously with their huge amount of teams. Um, and we scaled down to three locations uh, four teams onshore in the UK, one offshore that ha we had to have as part of the core product. Um, and, uh, and as I say, we were releasing more software on a more frequent basis, which meant that not only was it less painful and cheaper to get the software out, but they could actually predict and they could tell their partners when the next release of the product was coming um, and, what would, and more importantly, what would be in that release of the product. So the problems we had at the, at the beginning so month, simply just going to the monthly releases, driving that behavior, big upfront requirements documents, yes, improved because you only have to spec a month's worth of work at a time. Big upfront design, again, same thing that's gone, that's much clearer, you're not, you, there's no way you're gonna be designing a year ahead. Unclear scope of release, you can only fit too, so much in, it's much easier to plan just for that simple four week period. Um, unclear release dates, again, it was set in stone, you could set it a, a year in advance, we're gonna release literally the same day every month, which is exactly what they did. Um, failing manual deployments. So we didn't fix that as much as I would love to, and we, were work we ended up working on it. We didn't fix that through automation and through DevOps tooling and practices. Simply by cutting down the amount of change going through, fix the manual, the failing deployments. They were still manual, <laughs> but they weren't failing anymore. Um, but that also, off the back of this gave us the opportunity to start looking at, well, now we're looking at smaller changes. What can we actually automate? How can we start introducing those practices? Um, and started acceptance team, because they started building up the trust, they started moving into the delivery teams. Now, the key thing here is none of this, we wouldn't have been able to start with automated deployments um, with the previous approach of the long releases because we just couldn't, you, you couldn't, track and understand and manage this, the sheer volume of change or the amount of change that was going to go through in that one release. And they did spend um, 
separately about six months trying to automate the deployments for releases as they were going, but it was never ready. It was never, it was never at a point where you could actually run it in production. And then off the back of this, they started being able to put that in place and started to push it through sort of one technology at a time. Um, so that actually is pretty much it. But um, there's another, so this is, and as, as I said at the beginning, this is a, a, an emerging pattern that we've seen in other places. How you do it is different, but we saw exactly the same uh, at another telecoms client um, a year or two before. We just didn't kind of grok that that was going to be the secret until we'd gone through all the other pain. Um, and in that scenario, we actually, it's the question then is how do, you, how do you drive it? How do you drive the fact that you're going to move to monthly releases? Um, we were lucky here that it was driven by executive sponsorship. You just said, I need to have something out every month. Brilliant. In the other scenario, it was driven sort of by executive sponsorship, but we actually changed the bonus culture. So before, um, they were, there was a real, there was a battle between development and operations. Operations were bonused on the number of P, or the lack of P1 incidents. And every time they released something, there was a heightened chance of them receiving a P1 incident. So obviously they weren't gonna let anything through to, through to production. So we want, at, at, at the kind of year end, we changed the bonus structure to say, you're now bonused on 12, 11 months of the year, or 11 out of 12 releases have to go through smoothly. And you have to do, you have to release 11 times a year. Um, and again, that was the monthly, you, you need to get up there. Monthly's not the goal, it's just a way of getting there. Um, and so that was, that sort of, that f freed up the delivery pipeline, if you like, for, uh, for that organization. So, um, so that's it, yeah, lesson learned about, with a big organization trying to do transformation, figure out a way to get them to commit to releasing more frequently and then that'll allow everything else to be driven out by that because you're driving the right behaviors and then you can use all the tools and techniques etc to solve the problems as they come up so i'll wrap up there um i just wanted to say so i didn't have my contact details on but if that's my contact details if you um if you want them and i just wanted to do a very quick plug if that's all right we're running um a meetup group um a, a equal experts of night tech thing that we do we do it in London, we started doing them in Manchester, we're going to do our first one in Leeds on February 24th in Granary Wharf. So the first talk is going to be around building APIs for the government, around some work we're doing with HMRC to expose or uh, change their APIs to be a bit easier to consume. Um, and I'll be doing a talk on, um, uh, on a DevOps pipeline that we've, or sorry, an infrastructure pipeline um, that we've built in Chef for a multinational uh, bank. Um, and I'll do a, a live demo of the thing that we've built. Uh, obviously not their thing, my hack job on the side, because it's got to run in, in the cloud so you can see it. Um, but if you're interested, uh, have a look on Meetup and, and come along to that. Um, that's it. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening.